Hello everyone. I'm going to discuss the chapter 13 of the book Operating System Concepts. And the chapter is about the file system interface. The following will be our outline. We'll discuss about file concept, access methods, disk and directory structure, file system mounting, file sharing and protection. At the end of this chapter, you will be able to explain the function of file systems. You'll be able to describe the interfaces to file systems. You will be able to discuss file system design trade-offs, including access methods, file sharing, file locking, and directory structures. And finally, you will be able to explore file system protection. Computers can store information on various storage media such as non-volatile memory devices, hard disk drives, magnetic tapes, and optical disks. And files are mapped by the operating system onto physical devices. And these storage devices are usually non-volatile so that the contents are persistent between system reboots. A file is a named collection of related information that is recorded on secondary storage and from a user's perspective, a file is the smallest allotment of logical secondary storage and the data cannot be written to secondary storage unless they are within a file. Commonly, files represent programs okay? and the both source and the object forms and the data and data files can be numeric they can be alphabetic alphanumeric or we call it character or sometimes they are binary so basically files may be free form such as text file or may be formatted or in general a file is a sequence of bits bytes lines of records and the meaning of which is defined by the files creator and the user so the concept of a file is extremely general because files are the method users and applications use to store and retrieve data and because they are so general purpose their use has stretched beyond its original confines. So definitely the information in a file is defined by its creator and many different types of information may be stored in a file such as source or executable programs, numeric or text data, photos, music, video and so on so a file has a certain defined structure which depends on its type all right and a text field is a sequence of characters organized into lines and possibly pages a source field is a sequence of functions each of which is further organized as declarations followed by executable statements while an executable field is a series of code sections that the loader can bring into memory and execute. A file's attributes vary from one operating system to another but typically consists of the following. For example, a file can contain a name. So this is the symbolic file name and is the only information kept in human readable form. So this is what we can read. Identifier is a unique tag. Usually this is a number and it identifies the file within the file system. It's a non-human readable name for the file. So that's why it's called identifier. The next is the type and this information is needed for systems that support different types of files. Next is location and this information is a pointer 
to a device and to the location of the file on that device next we have what we call the size so the current size of the file wherein it can be in bytes words or blocks and possibly the maximum allowed size are included in this attribute the protection attribute is the access control information which determines who can do the reading the writing and the executing and so on also we have the timestamps and user identification and this information may be kept for creation last modification and last use and this data can be useful for protection security and usage monitoring so basically the information about the files are kept in the directory structure which is maintained on the disk and there are many variations of files and it includes extended file attributes such as the file checksum meanwhile the information are always kept in the directory structure so from the figure you will see an illustration of a field into window on a Mac operating system that displays a file attributes so basically Windows also has this properties of the file that we, we can see so all the information about the files is basically kept in the directory structure and sometimes it's displayed using a field information window such as this so basically a file is an abstract data type and to define a file properly we need to consider the operations that can be performed on files the operating system can provide system calls to create write read reposition delete and truncate the files so let's try to examine um, what the operating system must do to perform each of these seven basic file operations so it should be easy to see how other similar operations such as renaming a file can be implemented so basically in creating a field or creating a file two steps are necessary to create a file first space in the file system must be found for the file and we will discuss how to allocate space for the file in our next chapter second an entry for the new file must be made in a directory in opening the file rather than have all file operations specify a file name causing the operating system to evaluate the name check access permissions and so so all operations except create and delete require a file open all right and if successful the open call returns a file handle that is used as an argument in the other calls in writing a file we make a system call specifying both the open file handle and the information to be written to the file and the system must keep a write pointer to the location in the file where the next write is to take place if it's sequ sequential and the write pointer must be updated whenever a write occurs now to read a file we use a system call that specifies the file handle and wherein the next block of the file should be put again so the system needs to keep a read pointer to the location in the file where the next read is to take place if sequential and once the read has taken place the read pointer is updated 
And because a process is usually either reading from or writing to a file, the current operation location can be kept as a per process current file position pointer. So both the read and write operations use this same pointer, saving space and reducing system complexity. In terms of repositioning within the file, the current file position pointer of the open file is repositioned to a given value and the repositioning within a file need not involve any actual input output. So this operation is also known as the seek operation. right? In deleting a file, we search the directory for the name file. Having found the associated directory entry, we release all file space so that it can be reused by other files and erase or mark as free the directory entry. Note that some systems allow hard links, multiple names for the same file. And in this case, the actual file contents is not deleted until the last link is deleted. In truncating a file, the user may want to erase the contents of a file but keep its attributes so rather than forcing the user to delete the file and then recreate it this function allows all attributes to remain unchanged except for file length and the file can then be reset to length zero and its file space can be released so these seven basic operations comprise the minimal set of required file operations and other operations may include appending new information to the end of existing file and renaming an existing file. Once a file has been opened by one process, the system-wide table includes an entry for the file. Typically, the open file table has an open account associated with each file to indicate how many processes have the open file. So in summary, several pieces of information are associated with an open file. The first one is the file pointer. On systems that do not include a file offset as part of the read and write system calls, the system must track the last read write location right as a current file position pointer and this pointer is unique to each process operating on the file and therefore must be kept separate from the on disk file attributes the file open count so when we when the files are closed the operating system must reuse its open table or open file table entries or it could run out of space in the table multiple processes may have opened a file and the system must wait for the last file to close before removing the open file table entry so the file account or file open account tracks the number of opens and closes and reaches zero on the last closed so the system can then remove the entry for the location of the file most file operations require the system to read or write data within the file and the information needed to locate the file okay so basically, it can be on a file server across the network. It can be on a mass storage. So depending on the location, or it can be on a RAM drive. So they are kept in memory so that the system does not have to read it from the directory structure for each operation. Finally, we have the access rights, wherein each process opens a file in an access mode 
and this information is stored on the per process table so the operating system can allow or deny subsequent input output requests some of the operating systems provide facilities for locking an open file or sections of a file file locks allow one process to lock a file and prevent other processes from gaining access to it so file locks are useful for files that are shared by several processes for example a system log or a system log file that can be accessed and modified by a number of processes in the system so file locks provide functionality similar to reader writer locks covered in section 7 of this chapter so a shared lock is akin to a reader lock similar that means all right in that the several processes can acquire the lock concurrently an exclusive lock behaves like a writer lock only one process at a time can acquire such a lock and it's important to note that not accessing the um, not all operating systems provide both types of lock some systems provide only exclusive file locking furthermore operating systems may provide either mandatory or advisory file locking mechanisms and with mandatory once a process acquires an exclusive lock the operating system will prevent any other process from accessing the lock file right now when the lock is advisory then the operating system will not prevent the text editor from acquiring access to system log rather the text editor must be written so that it manually acquires the lock before accessing the file so basically in advisory processes can find the status of locks and decide what to do all right when we design a file system or indeed an entire operating system we always consider whether the operating system should recognize and support the file types so if an operating system recognizes the type of a file it can then operate on the file in reasonable ways for example a common mistake happen when a user tries to output the binary object form of a program and this attempt normally produces garbage however the attempt can succeed if the operating system has been told that the file is a binary object program now a common technique for implementing file types is to include the type as part of the file name so the name is split into two parts which is the name and an extension so usually it's separated by a period so you can see from the example given here we have the following example of file types and then the usual extension and its function so you can review this table from your PowerPoint presentation take a look on the different file types so we have different file types such as executable files object files source code batch files text files word processor library print or review or view sorry archive and multimedia so the usual extensions are covered also such as for executable we have the following we have dot exe dot com dot bean sometimes um, there is no extension for example so the function of the executable is to um, these are ready to run machine language program so when you try to double click 
or open this file it will immediately execute right meanwhile the obj or the object or the dot o these are the compiled and usually they are machine language and that means that object is not linked we are also familiar with source code wherein our usual extensions are .c, .cc, .java, .pass, .asm, or .a. All right? So these are source code in various languages. We also have batch files such as .bat or .sh, wherein these are commands to the command interpreter. For the text, we have text or .txt or .doc. Okay, these are for documents. And for word processors, we have the following. The most common is doc or docx. And then we have wp, rtf, and the text. So review this basic uh, file types and name extension so that uh, you, are, you will be familiar with the different file types in an operating system. File types also can be used to indicate the internal structure of the file and source and object files have structures that match the expectations of the programs that read them. And further, certain files must conform to a required structure that is understood by the operating system. So for example, the operating system requires that an executable file have a specific structure so that it can determine whether in memory to load the file and what the location of the first instruction is. And some operating systems extend this idea into a set of systems supported file structures with sets of special operations for manipulating files with those structures. So this point brings us to one of the disadvantages of having the operating system support multiple file structures. Number one, it makes the operating system large and cumbersome. Right? If the operating system defines five different file structures, it needs to contain the code to support these file structures. And in addition, it may be necessary to define every file as one of the file types supported by the operating system. So basically, files store information. And when the file is used, this information must be accessed and read into computer memory. And the information in the file can be accessed in several ways. Some systems provide only one access method for files. Others, such as the mainframe operating systems, support many access methods. And choosing the right one for a particular application is a major design problem. Now, the simplest access method is the sequential access. And the other one is the direct access. For the sequential access, information in the file is processed in order one record after the other and this mode of access is by far the most common for example editors and compilers usually access files in this fashion so reads and writes make up the bulk of the operations on a file a read operation or we call it the read next function call reads the next portion of the file and automatically advances a file pointer which tracks the input output location similarly the write operation or the write next function call appends to the end of the file and advances to the end of the newly written material or the new end of the file All right and such file can be reset to the beginning and on some systems a program may be able to skip forward or backward n records for some integer n 
So perhaps only for n which is equal to 1. Alright? So in sequential access, which is depicted on this figure, you will see, alright, that based on the tape model of a file, so basically it works as well as on sequential access devices uh, as it does the random access ones. Alright, so this figure illustrates the sequential access. So another method is direct access or relative access. And here a file is made up of fixed length uh, logical records. And it allows program to read and write records rapidly in no particular order. So the direct ac access method is based on a disk uh, model of a file. And since disks allow random access to any file block for direct access, the file is viewed as a numbered sequence of blocks or record. Thus, we may read block 14, for example, okay, so, and then write block 7. So, there are no restrictions on the order of reading or writing for a direct access file. So, the direct access files are of great use for immediate uh, access to large amounts of information and databases are often of this type so when a query concerning a particular subject arrives we compute which block contains the answer and then read the block directly to provide the desired, uh, desired information all right for the direct access method the file operations must be modified to include the block number as a parameter okay so for example we have read and then the n here should be inside the parameter where n is the block number so rather than uh, read next and write n rather than write next okay so these are all the symbols that is used for the direct access. Now the block number provided by the user to the operating system is normally a relative block number. And a relative block number is an index relative to the beginning of the file. So the first relative block of the file is 0 and the next is 1 and so on. Alright? So basically, relative block numbers allow the operating system to decide where the file should be placed. So in this figure, you can see a basic illustration of a simulation of a sequential access on direct access file. And this is done by simply keeping a variable CP that defines our current position. So during the reset sequential access, the implementation of that for the direct access is that the current position is equal to zero. For the read next, okay, the implementation for the direct access is that first the current position is read, that's why it's read's current position, and then the current position is equal to the current position plus 1, a value of 1. And then for the right next, right current position, and the current position will be equal to the current position plus 1. Okay? So that's a simulation of a sequential access on direct access file. Now, other access methods can be built on top of a direct access method. And these methods generally involve the construction of an index for the file okay so the index like an index in the back of a book contains pointers to the various blocks and to find a record in the file we first search the index and then use the pointer to access the file directly and to find the desired record
with large files the index itself may become too large to be kept in the memory and one solution is to create an index for the index file wherein the primary index file contains the pointers to the secondary index files which point to the actual data items alright now an example of the if the index is too large is the IBM index sequential access method or the ISAM and it uses a small master index that points disk blocks of a secondary index wherein the file is kept sorted on a defined key and to be able to find a particular item we first make a binary search of the master index and it provides the block number of the secondary index and this block is defined or read um, again and again and a binary search is used to find the block containing the desired record finally this block is searched sequentially and in this way any record can be located from its key by at most two direct access reads alright so in the following figure okay, you can see an example of a typical similar situation as implemented by open VMS index and relative files now for the disk structure this can be subdivided into partitions wherein the disk or the partitions can also be of RAID type to be able to be protected against the failure and disk or partition can be used raw or sometimes without a file system or it can be formatted with an appropriate file system the partitions also known as mini disks and slices and the entity containing the file system is known as the value or volume wherein the volume may contain a file system that tracks that file systems into uh, in device directory or volume table of contents in addition to general purpose file systems there are many special purpose file systems and they are frequently all within the same operating system or computer so the following are the different operations performed on directory such as searching for a file creating a file deleting a file listing a directory or list a directory rename a file and traverse the file system the simplest directory structure is the single level directory wherein all the files are contained in same directory um, it provides easy to support and understand however there are also significant limitations so for example when the number of files are increased and when the system has more than one user so since the files are in the same directory they should have unique names so definitely the problem for single level directory is the naming problem and then if two users for example um, call their data file for example test.txt or a text file then the unique the unique name rule is violated so for example in one programming class 23 students called the program for their second assignment prog2.c another 11 called it assign2.c right so basically there is a naming problem on this single level directory the second type of directory is the two level directory now as we have seen from the single level directory 
which often leads to confusion of file names among different users. The standard solution is to create a separate directory for each user. So in the two-level directory, each user has its own user file directory or we call it the UFD. So the UFDs have similar structures but each list only the files of a single user. Right? So when a user job starts or a user logs in, the system's master file directory or the MFD is searched. So it's searched from user 1, user 2, user 3, user 4 and so on. So the MFD is indexed by a username or account number. And each entry point points to the UFD for that particular user. So in two-level directory, the following can be existing, such as the path name of the file. And then it can have the same file name for different users provided of course that they have different paths and then the searching will be efficient however the problem with two level directory is that there is no grouping capability all right now once we have seen how to view a two level directory as a two level tree the natural generalization is to extend the directory structure to a tree of arbitrary height so in this figure you will see the directory structure and this is an example of a tree structured directories and this generalization allows users to create their own subdirectories and to organize their files accordingly so a tree is the most common directory structure and the tree has a root directory and in this particular example we have the spell the bin and the programs right and every file in the system has a unique path name okay for example these are the the files most probably they have unique path name now a directory or subdirectory contains a set of files or subdirectories. In many implementations, a directory is simply another file, but it is treated in a special way. Now all the directories have the same internal format. One bit in each directory entry defines the entry as a file or a subdirectory. Now, in normal use, each process has a current directory wherein the current directory should contain most of the files that are of current interest to the process. So, when reference is made to a file, the current directory is search. Alright? So, in the example, we have the following uh, working directory wherein we can search for the spell directory, the mail directory, and the prog directory. And then we can type the list wherein we are actually looking for all the files that are listed on the particular directory. Now in a cyclic graph directories, consider two programmers who are working on a joint project and the files associated with that project can be stored in a subdirectory separating them from other projects and files of the two programmers but since both programmers are equally responsible for the project both want the subdirectory to be in their own directories so in this situation the common subdirectory should be shared and a shared directory or file exists in the file system in two or more places at once so a tree prohibits or a tree structure prohibits the sharing of files or directories however in a cyclic graph directories or a cyclic graph 
wherein it denotes a graph with no cycles, it allows directories to share subdirectories and files as shown in this one, wherein you can see the count subdirectory. There are two sound, uh, sub directories here for the dict directory and the spell directory and they share a common file here okay so this is a natural generalization of the tree structured directory scheme however it's important to note that a shared file or directory is not the same as two copies of the file with two copies each programmer can view the copy rather than the original but if one programmer changes the file the changes will not appear in the other's copy but with the shared file like this only one actual file exists so any changes made by one person are immediately visible to the other so sharing is particularly important for subdirectories and a new file created by one person will automatically appear in all the shared subdirectories. The shared files and subdirectories can be implemented in several ways. And a common way exemplified by Unix systems is to create a new directory entry called a link. Okay, this is the link. And a link is effectively a pointer to another file or subdirectory. So for example, a link may be implemented as an absolute or a relative path name. When a reference to a file is made, we search the directory. If the directory entry is marked as a link, then the name of the real file is included in the link information. So we resolve the link by using the path name to locate the real file. And links are easily identified by their format in the directory entry or by having a special type on systems that support the types and are effectively indirect pointers. So the operating systems ignores these links when traversing directory trees to preserve the acyclic structure of the system. Now, a serious problem when using an acyclic graph structure is ensuring that there are no cycles. If we start with a two-level directory and allow users to create subdirectories, a tree structured directory results. It should be fair easy to you see that simply adding new files and subdirectories to an existing tree structured directory preserves the tree structured nature however when we add links the tree structure is destroyed resulting in a simple graph structure okay so here in this particular image you will see a simple graph structure Okay. Now, one of the common possibility of anomaly that happens in a general graph directory is the possibility of self-referencing or a cycle in the directory structure. And in this case, we generally need to use a garbage collection. All right. And what is a garbage selection? Ah, uh, collection. It's a scheme to determine when the last reference has been deleted and the disk space can be reallocated. So garbage collection involves traversing the entire file system marking everything that can be accessed. Then a second pass collects everything that is not marked onto a list of free space. Okay, So a similar marking procedure can be used to ensure that a traversal or search will cover everything in the file system once and only once. The garbage collection for a disk-based file system, however, is extremely time-consuming and is thus seldom attempted. Alright? Now, garbage collection is 
necessary only because of possible cycles in the graph okay now there are algorithms to detect cycle in the graphs however they are also computationally expensive especially when the graph is on a disk storage now a simple algorithm in the special case of directories and links is to bypass the links okay during directory traversals from that point cycles are avoided and no extra overhead or overhead is incurred now when information is stored in a computer system we want to keep it safe from physical damage so we're talking about the issue of reliability there and improper access which is the issue of protection so basically reliability is generally provided by duplicate copies of the files and many computers have uh, systems programs that automatically or through computer operator intervention that would copy disk files to a tape at regular intervals sometimes once per day or week or month and that is to be able to maintain a copy should the file system be accidentally destroyed now file systems can be damaged by hardware problems such as errors in reading or writing sometimes it can be caused by power surges or failures sometimes head crashes sometimes due to dirt and sometimes due to temperature extremes and vandalism so basically files can be deleted accidentally and bugs in the file system software can also cause file contents to be lost so definitely reliability is an issue as well as protection so protection can be provided in many ways for example in a laptop system running a modern operating system we might provide protection by requiring a username and password authentication to access it and then encrypting the secondary storage so even someone opening the laptop and removing the drive would have a difficult time accessing its data and of course firewalling the network access so that when it is in use it is difficult to break in in uh, via its networking connection in multi-user system even valid access of the system needs more advanced mechanisms to allow only valid access of the data so basically the need to protect files is a direct result of the ability to access the files and systems that do not permit access to the files of other users do not need protection thus we could provide complete protection by prohibiting access alternatively we could provide free access with no protection and both approaches are too extreme for general use now what is needed is controlled access so protection mechanisms provide controlled access by limiting the types of file access that can be made for example access is permitted or denied depending on several factors one of which is the type of access requested and several different types of operations may be controlled such as the read no, which means the read from the file write write means to write or rewrite the file execute means to load the file into memory and execute it append which means to write new information at the end of the file delete means to delete the file and free its space for possible reuse and finally we have the list or list the name and attributes of the file there's also another option we call it the attribute change which is to change the attributes of the file now the most common approach to the protection problem is to make access dependent on the identity of the user and different users may need different types of access to a file or directory and the most 
general scheme to implement identifying or identity dependent access is to associate with each file and directory an access control list or we call it the ACL so this ACL uh, specifies the usernames and the types of access that are allowed for each user so when a user requests an access to a particular file the operating system checks the access list associated with that file and if that user is listed for the requested access the access is allowed otherwise a protection violation occurs and the user job is denied access to the file so basically this approach has the advantage of enabling complex access methodologies but the main problem with access lists is their length so if we want to allow everyone's uh, everyone to read a file for example we must list all users with read access and this technique has two undesirable consequences right so for example constructing such a list may be tedious and unrewarding task and second the directory entry previously of fixed size should now have a variable size which result in a more complicated space management now the these problems can be resolved by use of a condensed version of the access list and the converse or condensed uh, version is to condense the length of the access control list and many systems recognize three classifications of users in connection with each file so for Unix and Linux they call it the owner access the group access and the public access okay so in the owner access the user who created the file is the owner and in the group a set of users who are sharing the file and need similar access is a group or a work group all right so for the other types of file or the other users in the system we can call it a public access all right so the most common recent approach is to combine access control list with the more general and easier to implement okay the owner the group and the universe access control scheme just described okay so as an example we can see from here an owner access okay which has a value of seven so where did seven came from it's from the attributes of read write and execute so if all these attributes are marked as one then definitely from the four to one rule the total of which is equal to seven so basically the first least significant bit here represents the one the second is two and the third one is four so four plus two plus one will be equal to 7 meanwhile the group access is symboled as 6 wherein only the read and write are uh, for example um, mark as 1 while in the public access only the executable or X is marked as 1 that's why it's called uh, it's converted into a value of 1 alright now there is another um, symbolical formation here for example in a particular scheme like this ch mod 761 and game so that means the owner symbolized as 7 and the group is symbolized as 6 and the public is symbolized as 1 okay so basically And that is the directory protection and file protection in a unix system so in this particular example we can see that each file and directory are three fields so basically the owner the group and the universe 
for the public access each consisting of the three bits R, W, X where R controls the read access W controls the write access and X controls the execution so a user can list the content of a subdirectory only if the R bit is set in the appropriate field similarly a user can change his current directory to another current directory only if the X bit associated with the particular directory or subdirectory is set in the appropriate field alright for Windows uh, operating system the Windows users are typically managing the access control list via the graphical user interface so in this figure we can see a file permission window on a Windows 7 NTFS file system and in this example we can see a user guess okay and specifically denied access to the uh, file list panel okay that Java so this is an example of a Windows 7 access control list management via a graphical user interface and this one is an example of a directory listing from a Unix environment so the first field describes the protection of the file or directory so if you see a D here which is the first character it indicates a subdirectory okay also shown are the number of the links to the file and to the owner's name and the group's name the size of the bytes the date of the last modification and finally the file's name with optional extension so that's basically a sample of the unix directory listing